want to begin by saying thank you to Liz. Uh, this is a great example of why women are awesome. Uh, I would never have thought of how to improve the aesthetic of this setup. This is an awful room for a group of this size, to be perfectly honest with you. This, this room is designed for 400 people, and then when you stick 40 in here, it's awful. And we only do it when we have to, um, and, and we have to. Uh, but this is just great. I just thought that was neat how she came in and put the chairs and the thing and saw all that, and, and uh, the food. I just, anyway, I appreciate that. And as a lady, you know, there's an old expression, you can't ask a fish to describe water. Obviously, this is all you know because you're ladies, but you don't get this in men's group. Our setup is always ugly, functional, and bereft of beauty and food. Uh, and, and so, anyway, I'm just enjoying being here and wondering how I can worm my way w deeper into women's ministry because I like it. I like it better here. Um, anyway, so I'm glad that you're here and I'm glad that I'm here. And uh, I'm thankful for Liz and the leadership she gives to this group. So maybe we could begin just by showing our appreciation. Yay. All right. Well, last week uh, we began where I think you have to begin in a class like this. You have to begin with your doctrine of Scripture. Um, everything we do flows out of what we believe about God's Word. Uh, we, we used a similar, not exactly the same, but a, a sort of similar exercise in the lay preaching workshop. And I actually asked them a variety of questions. You remember last, last time when we were together, we looked at those four areas. We looked at authority, clarity, necessity and sufficiency. And in the lay preaching workshop, I asked this question for reflection after we got through it. I said, suppose you didn't believe what we believe about authority. And so I changed a couple of, this, of the statements around. I said, how would you preach differently? And it was interesting. They were able to reflect on how they would preach differently. And then I asked them a question. I said, you know, suppose you didn't believe what we believe on, on clarity. How would you preach differently? We, again, we changed a few of the statements around. And they were able to answer that. Necessity. By the way, anybody want to give us a one? Let's. Anybody want to give us a one sentence definition of necessity with respect to the doctrine of Scripture? What do we mean when we refer to the necessity of Scripture? This is a test of whether last month was useful. What do we mean? Yeah. Any, yeah go ahead. Either I pointed at both of you. Uh, what we talked about is how the, the natural revelation, which is what you can know about God by looking at nature and by studying human beings and, and looking inside yourself and, and just noticing the beauty and the uniqueness of human beings, that's natural revelation. Natural revelation is sufficient to damn us, but not to save us. That's what Paul says in Romans 1. Uh, he says the, you know, uh, the things that can be known about God, his eternal nature and divine power, uh, observable as they are or knowable as they are through the things that he has made, um, uh, then, he, then he goes on to say, yet, uh, therefore they are without excuse. So the things that can be known by God are known to all. He says in Romans 1.18 that they're suppressed in wickedness. Uh, but he says, but, but they basically just leave us without excuse. They leave us without anything to say in our own defense on Judgment Day. Because, of course, you know that nobody is sent to hell for disbelieving the gospel. They're sent to hell for rebelling against what they know about God. And what the Bible says is everybody rebels against what they know about God. Some know more than others. But so here's the point. W without the Bible, everyone would only know that which is sufficient to justly damn us. But to actually be saved, we need stuff that's only in the Bible. We, we, need, we need to know about Jesus. We need to know about his life, his death, his resurrection. You, you can't look up into the stars and discover that Jesus lived a perfect life and died on a Roman cross and after the th on the third day rose again and ascended. You, you can look at the stars till the cows come home. You're not going to find that information. What you can learn from natural revelation is that there is a God. He is ordered and good and that we are less than him and therefore accountable to him. That's all you can learn. But knowing that, you're without excuse because why weren't you in submission to him? Why didn't you seek out his will and do it? Why didn't you give him praise? Why didn't you thank him for all your blessings? Oh, that's true. Okay, so 
Again, that's what we mean by necessity. But suppose we didn't believe that. How would we preach differently? We, we talked about that. And then sufficiency. Suppose you didn't believe the scripture. And here's actually, you can, you can actually tell what your church believes about the Bible by how they preach. You can reverse engineer all this, by the way. But suppose we didn't believe in the sufficiency of scripture. How would you preach differently? I asked them all those questions. Anyway, th- the same is true whether you're a preacher or not. However you're planning to use the knowledge that we're going to be acquiring over the next several weeks together uh, is the way you use it and the things you try to do with it are all going to go back to what you actually believe about the Bible. How you minister. I'll, g- I'll give you a very just quick personal anecdote, an illustration that hopefully will bring us to light. When I was a youth pastor, I remember just thinking in my soul, um, I, I don't want to pl- be the popcorn and fun guy. Like, I'm going to have fun because I like to have fun and I, I think everything is funny. And, and uh, so I want to have fun, but, but I am, we're going to do like 45 minutes of fun and then we're going to do like 45 minutes of hard Bible study. And, and I remember tons of people telling me, kids won't come for that. Like, kids, you can't be bringing your Bible and saying, open your Bible. Kids don't even know what the Bible is anymore. You can't. That's maybe how it was in your day, people would say, when you were a kid. But you can't do it that way. And I said, well, you know what? Here's what I think. Either the Bible is true, and either, either, either the Bible works, or it's not true, and we're all wasting our time. So why don't we just find out? So I'll do it. And if the kids don't respond and if nobody's life has changed, then we'll know it's all a crock anyway. And I'll go and sell insurance and make lots of money, right? Like, let's figure it out quick. Let's not waste our time. That's sort of my attitude. So we did like 45-minute Bible studies. And, and, and our youth group grew and grew and grew. And kids got saved and changed. And, and I just became convinced that the Bible works. It's, it's true and it, and it works. And so my whole ministry is actually flows out of this belief that the Bible works. This is a crude way of saying it, but I actually think the Bible's magic. Uh, and, like I say this to the guys in, the, in our preaching workshops. We have one in the morning, one and I, I, you know, I say, this is why you'd have to be an idiot not to preach the Bible. Like who gets up and gives their 10 opinions about marriage? Like, oh my goodness. Because here's the thing. The Bible is magic. It's like pixie dust. And so if there's Bible in your sermon, even if everything about your sermon sucks, if, and take that out of the tape, but <laughs> even if everything you in your sermon stinks, somebody's life is going to be changed because there's Bible in it. It's magic. It's pixie dust, right? And I, I, I believe that. And, and, and my heart last week was to get that belief into you because if you believe that, it'll change the way you do ministry. It'll change the way you mother, Right? Like, I sometimes feel like family devotions is a colossal waste of time because, uh, like, one kid's got his head hanging down and the other is, you know, dreaming about whatever. And you wonder, like, does anything work? But because we're going through the Bible, it's magic. It's in there somewhere. It's like magic rocks in their soul, right, that, that are going to be there and that are going to be, le- like, they're like radioactive nuclear rocks in their soul, leaching radiation into their very person, right? Oh, and, and it's going to be there forever. And, uh, and you're like, I just, I believe that. Anyway, so what you believe about the Bible influences how you do ministry. Okay. But we also said that, that the order may feel odd to you because we worship God, right? Not the Bible. I hope you know that. Whew. Super important to know that. Um, we're, we don't worship the Bible. And sometimes evangelicals get accused of that, don't we? I've heard lots of people say, well, you evangelicals, you worship God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible, (laughs) right? Which is, you know, everyone thinks that's quite the funny joke. Uh, Am I the only one that's ever heard that joke? You need funnier friends. I just say, oh, some of you have, okay. Um, But because they say, well, you make too much of the Bible. Well, we don't worship the Bible, but we read the Bible because we believe, how else are we going to know anything useful about God, right? What we actually worship is the Christ of Scripture, and, and so theologians have been talking about this for literally, well, I almost probably, it would be an exaggeration to say thousands of years, but certainly many, many, many hundreds of years. When you're starting a conversation like this, should you start with the doctrine of God or the doctrine of Scripture? And where we've kind of landed is the doctrine of God is ultimate. That's the most important thing. But the doctrine of Scripture is foundational. It's where you have to start. And so that's why we did it. So, so today we're moving from that which is foundational to that which is ultimate. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so we're going to begin, uh, again, like we're going to read, and, and, and so it's not just going to be my voice, and that'll be tricky for those who are following at home, but I think, uh, following on the video, but I think they've got access to these handouts regardless, so it's going to work out just fine. So somebody in their best outside voice read that introductory paragraph and the first standalone sentence, and then somebody else pick it up and we'll share the reading because you remember more of what you read than what you hear. And you remember more of what you say than what you hear. So we're going to get your reading and we're going to get you saying. All right, go. And I'm going to chew crackers. Go. Mm hmm. Yeah, so that footnote actually comes from a book on the doctrine of God by Gerald Bray. If you're going to write a book called The Doctrine of God, you're going to begin with that sentence uh, or some version of it because it's, it's a ma writing a book on the doctrine of God is like trying to uh, empty the Pacific Ocean with a teacup, right? Like y you understand you're, you're, you're just going to scratch the surface. Well, if that's true in a book length treatment of a topic, obviously in our small group tonight, it is even more so. We're dipping the Pacific Ocean dry with a thimble. Okay, let's keep reading. Don't be shy. You're wasting time with shyness. Shyness is a sin. Go. By the way, that's a great quote. The Bible doesn't tell you everything you want to know. Like sometimes we go to the Bible and we're looking for muffin recipes. We're looking for all kinds of stuff that may or may not be true, but isn't necessarily in the Bible. Like the Bible's job is not to answer every question you have. The Bible has a very specific focus. It's an account of God's way of saving men and women. That's, what you, that, that's, that's important. It doesn't answer the question how many angels could stand on the head of a pin. It's not interested in that. Okay, it has a very specific focus. All right, next paragraph. Right, so if we were having an ontological discussion about God, that means, like, who is God in essence? We'd be talking about his eternality, his immutability, his, like, those are qualities that are inherent in God, intrinsic, that have to do with his essence, which is an interesting conversation. Uh, that isn't the primary interest of the Bible. If you notice, like, what book of the, here's a question to get you thinking. What book of the Bible is primarily interested in the ontology of God, who God is within himself? Anyone? Yeah, good. There aren't any. Uh, that was a trick question. There are none. Like, that's good. There are no books of the Bible that are primarily interested with God's ontology. Uh, the, the, what we know about God's ontology is all accidental, meaning it, along the way, we get a comment here and there. For instance, one of the best ontological comments about, about God is actually comes to us in Exodus, right? That's where you get the I am uh, passages. But what's the book of Exodus? What's the book of Exodus about? The ontology of God? No, it's actually about how God redeemed his people from Egypt. See what I mean by accidental? Like the purpose of the book is to talk about how God saves. Along the way, you learn some about who he, who he is within himself. Right? So the, that's why it's a more useful conversation, particularly if you don't have 74 days to have the conversation. It's a, woo! What happened there? Liz, what have you done with your aesthetic beauty over there? That's entirely my fault. That's why you're only allowed water in the sanctuary. Um, that's why a far more useful conversation is a conversation about how God is towards us. 
with respect to our salvation. All right, let's finish. As we read. All right, so here's how we're going to do this. It's a long exercise, but I think a useful exercise. Um, what we'll do is we'll give, we'll elect a spokesperson, and so you don't get tired, we'll maybe do two rows per spokesperson. So could we, or not spokesperson, um, chart person. Who'd like to be our scribe, our group scribe for the first two lines? We're just going to try and agree on some statements. Anyone? Just some, The only requirement for this job is that you have reasonably uh, neat handwriting. Okay. All right. So uh, the first two I've done for you. So we're going to bring you in at statement three, four, and five. So if you want to just sit in the front row there for a second so you don't, you don't get tired. But uh, so let's get our Bibles open and read Genesis 1 1. These are uh, these. Uh, scriptures are organized in canonical order, so you sh meaning like from left to right in your Bible, you should, it, to make it easier for you to look them all up. Canon means list of books of Bible, the books of the Bible. All right, so Genesis 1-1. You probably have it memorized, but go ahead. Right. Okay, so look at the comprehension task. I've filled in the, f the first sentence. All the sentences begin with, God is the God of who? Okay, now what does Genesis 1 1 tell us? It's very important. Genesis 1 1 tells us that God is the God who has existed forever and who has the power of life within himself. Now, if you took any philosophy in university, um, you are A, unemployed, uh, <laughs> as a joke, uh, not untrue, but unkind. Uh, you would, if you took any philosophy in university, you would know that. For anything, this is a, a maximum of a, a maximum philosophy. In order for anything to exist, something must have existed forever that has the power of life within itself. Okay, that's just a for any worldview to be coherent, it, it, it has to wrestle with that first first principle. It's the answer to the uh, chicken and the egg. By the way, that's like people say that as though it's it's a thing, like what came first, the chicken or the egg. Philosophers know the answer to that. The answer is an eternal chicken. Um, for anything to exist, there must have been something that has existed forever that has the power of life within itself. See, people will sometimes say to you, this is like, I would say first year university, you know, gotcha question, but it doesn't even rise that level. It's more like grade four gotcha question, um, right? Like, you believe in God? Oh, yeah? Who created God? Right? And you're like, that, that's an interesting question, but it doesn't actually answer anything. It's not an argument because... If I said, well, this created God, then you would just say, oh, yeah, well, who created that? And they're trying to get you into the spiral. But then you'd say, okay, are you saying that nothing exists? No, something exists. Then you say, well, then obviously things exist, and there must have been something that has existed forever that has the power of life within itself. Because one thing we know is that everything in this universe has a cause, right? So there has to be an uncaused causer. There has to be something that has existed forever and that has the power of, that, that can produce other things. There has to be. There has to be an internal chicken. Uh, there are only two coherent options that are provided by any worldview. One option is that the universe has existed forever, and it has the power of life within itself. The universe is self-generating. Uh, what's a religion in the world that believes that? Hinduism believes that. Hinduism believes in an eternal universe. And that the universe produces, has life within itself. Uh, who else believes that? Or who else in history has believed that? Paganism, Roman paganism, Greek paganism believed that. Science actually believed that until the Big Bang Theory. Anyone here old enough to have taken physics? Oh, yeah, that's an embarrassing question, I guess. But uh, anyone remember Carl Sagan? Anyone remember Carl Sagan? He used to have a show on television called, on, the, on PBS called, Cos was it called Cosmos? Or The Cosmos or something like that. Um, and anybody remember the opening line in, in that show? No? Uh, the opening line in the show Cosmos or The Cosmos was 
something, to, and I won't get it exactly right, but something. In the beginning was the universe. It was all there ever was. And one day it will be all there ever is. Or something to that effect. I don't have it exactly right. But he basically, before the Big Bang Theory, uh, it was the steady state theory, which is the idea that the universe has existed forever uh, and will exist forever, and that it is it has the power of life within itself. The Big Bang Theory represented a, a watershed change in cosmology uh, because the Big Bang Theory was basically the moment when science realized the universe had a beginning. All that is to say, there are only two coherent options to the question, what has existed forever and has the power of life within itself? And those two options are the universe or God, that there is some intelligent being that has existed forever and that produces things, makes things. So the Bible begins by ask, answering the primary question. It's saying God is the answer to the question, what has existed forever and has the power of life within itself? In the beginning was God, right? He made the heavens, he made the earth, and everything Everything in it. Okay, so first thing we learn about God is the first thing the Bible says. He is the God who has existed forever and who has the power of life within himself. Number two, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Somebody else read that in your best outdoor voice. So, second statement, he is the God who made us in his image and likeness and assigned us our purpose and identity. Again, that's when Romans 1 says that you know enough to be damned, right? Which is what it says in Romans 1, 18 to 20, from natural revelation. It's basically just saying those two things. When you look up at the stars, I mean, come on, how can you really believe that the universe is, has the power of life within itself? It's just a bunch of gases and rocks. Um, like, have you ever met a gas or a rock that could make anything? Uh, like, when was the last time a rock made a cake? Uh, it's never happened. When was the last time a gas made anything? Um, so there ha I mean, you should be able to look at the universe and realize this can't be the source of it all. There has to be an intelligent mind behind all this, right? And, and then it, once you get that, you can already get this as well, which is the idea that so this intelligent God made us. And obviously made us for a reason, because he made us very different than all the other animals. All right, so the Bible says we were actually made in the image and likeness of God. Selem and Dumuth are the Hebrew words there. They were originally only used in, in Egyptian culture, because the first people to ever hear Genesis read were who? Who were the first people to ever hear Genesis read? Well, they wouldn't have heard it read. Uh, the, the story, because I mean, Genesis goes all the way to Joseph, right? Who were the first people to hear it read? Yeah, the, the recently liberated Jewish slaves wandering in the desert, right? Moses was writing it up on Mount Sinai, right? Um, and so the very first people to hear it had lived as Egyptians for 400 years. They were basically just the, the lower classes of Egyptian society. Their language was essentially Egyptian. Hebrew is, is basically an Egyptian dialogue, or dialect, I should say. Their culture, do you remember when they went to bury Joseph? The Canaanites said the Egyptians are having a funeral, meaning the the original Jews were indistinguishable from poor Egyptians. So a bunch of poor Egyptians hear, heard in the Bible that they were made in the image and likeness of God, the Tselem and Demuth, words that in Egyptian culture were only ever applied to Pharaoh. See, what the Egyptians believe about Pharaoh is similar to what we believe about Jesus, that he is the image and likeness of God, that he is God in the flesh. They believe that about Pharaoh. They believe that he was born a, like he has, he's a true human. He was born in flesh. He had a mummy and a daddy. But then because he is the Pharaoh, by nature of his position, he is filled with the Spirit of God and becomes both God and man. And, and that was the only person in Egyptian society who was called Selem and Demuth. And now Moses says to a bunch of recently liberated Egyptian slaves, which is basically what the first Jews were, you are every single one of you, man and woman, Selem and Demuth. You are all kings and queens sons and daughters of the living God. That's quite remarkable, right? And, and so the Bible says that, that God is the God who makes us, gives us a purpose, gives us a job, and assigns us dignity and worth. Which means, basically, to put it in, in very simple terms, this is God's house, He makes the rules, and He tells us what to do. 
that is the truth we suppress in wickedness so that we can be gods unto ourselves, right? Interestingly, this is a bit of a bunny trail, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. Uh, Jordan Peterson, who's not a Christian, but who's fascinated with the Bible, actually refers to the Genesis narratives as archetypal, meaning he says you cannot understand human beings unless you understand Genesis. So he doesn't believe they're true in the sense that they actually happened. He believes they're true in an archetypal sense, meaning what he says is all human beings do what Adam and Eve did. We pretend we don't know God, so that we can be gods unto ourselves. The deep, dark, destructive craving of every human being is absolute autonomy. And, and, and he would say, now, he says, I'm not saying there was an actual Adam and Eve. That's what he would say. But he would say, but that's the truest thing that's ever been written, ever. And, he says, and, and so he would go on to say, happiness is basically about surrendering autonomy so that we can be in relationship. Isn't that interesting? Anyway, so whether, I mean, it's just very important for us to understand this stuff, but the Bible addresses all the big issues, okay? Genesis 2, 1 to 3. Now we're into the stuff that we're going to work on together, and we're going to do these together. Oh, sorry, that was very loud. Okay, I'm going to get out my pen too. Okay. So let's read the next one, Genesis 2, 1 to 3, and we're trying to fill in the sentence, he is the God who. We're going to work together, and we're going to help our scribe. Okay? So somebody read Genesis 2, 1 to 3. Okay. Well, so what? What are we going to say here? God is the God who what? And you don't have to write God is the God who. Just finish the sentence there beside three. God is the God who, who, who what? Yeah, we've already got creatives. Let's try to build. You're right, though. Yeah, but move past that. So what is Genesis 2? Rest. And, and so the, the sense of rest, the word there for rest is the word that becomes Sabbath, right? Has the sense of to enjoy, Right? So God rests. So God is the God who rests and enjoys his creation. And then what else might we want to say there? Well, where does it say that? Okay, he made it holy. He makes things holy. Okay. Yeah. And then what are, we're missing another key word there in verse 3. Mm-hmm. Yep. So there's a bunch of things we could say. I think we want to make sure we get the blessed in there, the rest in there, the enjoy in there, the designates, like who makes times and seasons. Somebody said holy, which means to set apart. Somebody else said, what did somebody else say? Oh, they, they made it special or whatever it was. All right, so let's turn that into a sentence. He is the God who what? Uh-huh. Yeah, and determine. How about this? And determines channels of blessing. Okay, so let's work on that sentence together. God is the God who rests and enjoys His creation, and who establishes channels of blessing. So He makes times and places for people to go and be blessed. Okay, sounds good to me. And establishes channels of blessing. Let's just say that. June, do you want to sing channels only? I mean, this is actually something we used to teach all the time. Uh, we use the phrase uh, ordinary means. What is, what's the phrase ordinary means mean? It means there are things. What's the term sacrament mean? Why does communion matter? Why don't we do communion with Pepsi and chips whenever we feel like it? Why don't you go home, take some Pepsi and chips, and call it communion? And you don't. Why not? So when we call it an ordinary means, we're saying these are things where God has promised to meet us with blessing and grace, right? That's what, that's what an ordinance is. It's not holy, it's not magic water, but when you come in faith to the table, God promises to meet you there with blessing and grace, doesn't he? Which is why we call it thank you. Because why? Because we expect to receive. We remember what God has done, and we position ourselves to receive. 
because that's, but God says, here's where you can expect blessing. And ultimately, of course, the ultimate expression of that is the cross. Come to the cross for blessing. So God is the God who makes everything, enjoys everything, and also says, here's a place for blessing. Okay, good. Next. Let's read the next one. All right, that one's pretty obvious. So God is the God who what? Sorry? Um, well, providing was in chapter 1. He's not providing here. What's he doing? He's commanding and limiting. God is the God who assigns tasks and establishes limits. He's a parent. He says, you got work to do, boy. You got chores. And here, there, these are the house rules. If you miss this, you miss the Bible, right? If your vision of God is he's just a dopey old grandpa who, who gives you candy, assigns tasks, and establishes limits, well, you're doing great. I would say if you miss this, uh, you distort, you distort the, the gospel, establishes limits. You got it. God is not a grandfather. That's why the Lord's Prayer is not our grandfather who art in heaven, because grandpas don't enforce limits. They give you candy, and that's it, um, right? But a, a parent is supposed to assign chores, or tasks, and establish limits. These are the house rules, okay? Number five, Genesis 3, 9 to 24. This is a longer one. Women are trouble. <laughs> Sorry. No. Snakes are trouble. All right, that's a lot, but let's turn it into a sentence. And I think it can be a fairly short sentence. What are the two themes of that, of that passage we just read? Curse, curse? yep. Pardon? Punishment? Yeah, uh, curse and punishment. Or, yeah, don't start right until we, because this is a long one. We're probably going to have a couple starts at this one. Curse and punishment, let's call synonyms, because that's what the curse is. The curse is the punishment of God. It's the opposite of the blessing of God. So that's one theme. What else? Yeah, which is the same, right? Consequence, punishment, curse, those are all synonyms. It's a, that's one side. What else is there in this passage? You're missing the best part. 
Judgment, that's all the same. Judgment, punishment, curse, those are all words that mean the same thing. Yeah, promise, promise. Like the garments were a promise, and there's a promise, promise. Genesis 3.15, somebody read that. It's the most important verse in the Bible. Yeah, that's called the Protevangelion, the first giving of the gospel. The gospel begins as this tiny little promise. It's like a snowball. And as it rolls through the Old Testament, it gets bigger and bigger. Every covenant is like another layer of snow. On the, on the, it doesn't, meaning it never changes. It just gets bigger. So the original promise is that there's going to be constant warfare between the devil and people. Not between the devil and God, right? That would not be a fair fight. Uh, but between the devil and God. The devil wants to be what God made you to be. God made you royalty royal sons and daughters, over everything but under God, second in the kingdom, basically. That's the job the devil wants. So he's at war with you. And God, so God says to the, to the woman, there's going to be constant warfare between you and the devil now. Uh, that, you know, that's, that's the reality. You, you have basically uh, created a battleground. You have thrown your position up in the air, and, and now it's, British Bull. it's a free-for-all, right? But he says, but the good news is, a child will come, born of a woman, who will crush the devil's head, and the devil will bruise his heel. Meaning, he will defeat your enemy at some cost to himself. Well, what is that? That's the gospel, right? That's, Jesus is eventually the child who comes, born of the woman, born of Mary, who defeats the devil, crushes his head, wins a crushing victory at some cost to himself. Not, not without cost, right? Not without blood. So that's the, the gospel never changes from the first page of your Bible to the last page. What happens is you get more and more content. So you get the, let's take the Abrahamic covenant. What does the Abrahamic covenant add to the gospel? The knowledge that the child, the human child, will be a Jew. Okay, great. So he'll be a Jew. We'll watch for a Jew. Uh, and then we wait and we wait and we wait and we get the Davidic covenant. What does the Davidic covenant add to the gospel? Not only will he be a Jew, he'll be a king in the line of David. Great. Right. But again, this, this, that's not new or that's not different. That's just new. It's just more information. So that's why they call it the prot evangelion. It's the gospel kernel that rolls forward through the Old Testament, becomes a bigger and bigger and snowball until it lands on Jesus. So here's what we've learned in that passage. God is the God who punishes and promises. By the way, once you understand that, whole books of the Bible will be easy to figure out. The book of Hosea constantly alternates between punishment and promise. So God, God says, like, you know, I'm going to send you into exile. I'm going to grind you down to dust. But then I'm going to gather you back in, and the family's going to be bigger than ever it was before. Right? I mean, so that's exactly the rhythm of a whole bunch of books in the Bible. And you say, well, that's Old Testament. Ah, Hebrews 12, 4 and 5. What child is there that the father doesn't punish, right? The fact that you're being punished right now proves that you're legitimate children because that's who God is, right? If your vision of God does not include punishment, now, not punishment, not judgment. In the New Testament, the, the feel of, of punishment changes. But maybe let's just, so you don't walk, I hate it when people say, that's Old Testament, and write it off. Let's read like, open your Bibles to Hebrews 12. Just quick. Keep your finger where you are in Genesis, because we'll be back there in just a minute. But somebody read Hebrews 12, 4 and 5. 4, 5, and 6, actually. But It's like sword drill. First one to get it, reads it. Hebrews 12, 4, 5, 6. Go. So he's talking, right, he's talking there to a group of Christians, we believe in Rome, who, had, who were um, marginalized and, and not quite persecuted uh, under, uh, was it Tiberius? It doesn't matter. I can't recall the, the Roman emperor, but they were, they were kicked, their, their property was seized, and they were temporarily exiled from Rome. So he says, you haven't suffered yet um, to the shedding of blood. I can't remember now which, it doesn't matter, does it? Um, but they, they, were, they lost their property, and, and they were forced to move. So imagine if you had to leave Aurelia, and your house was just seized by the government. And, and he actually, he has the audacity to say, this is, the, this is a punishment of God. He's, he's giving you a spanking. Not to kill you, but to like, make you question, what are you holding on to? Now keep reading. Okay. 
The Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises. The word for chastises there is actually the word for scourge, as in with a whip. Yeah, keep reading. Yeah. All right, anyway, we got the idea. God punishes and promises. That's who he is. All right, so now let's do the next one, number six. Genesis 6, 5 to 8. Yeah, by the way, that's like one of the most theologically shocking passages in all the Bible. Like, it, You can actually pause there and be like, what the heck does that mean? How can a God who knows everything regret? Now, that is for, that's unpacked in the Bible. That's such a shocking statement that the Bible has to come back to it and say, well, not he doesn't regret in the way that a man regrets, uh, where he might do something stupid and say, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. No, no, no. But the point is God is deeply grieved by sin. All right, so let's, let's write that down. God is a God who is deeply grieved by sin. I would say again, if you don't know that, you're going to struggle with the gospel. All right, next one. Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Next. Yeah, oh yes, and a new, a new scribe. Great work, by the way. Very legible. Very legible. My mother would be proud. Where is my mother? Has she apostatized entirely? It's hard to say. All right. We'll note her lack of attention. Uh, new scribe? Don't waste time with shyness. Shyness is a sin. There we go. Okay. Okay. Number seven, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Go. Or how do you want to write that as a sentence? God is the God who what? Yeah, I mean, that would work. Makes covenants. Uh, that I know exactly what you mean, and that is correct. That would work if we put that. What's another way you might want to say that? That might just be more obvious and easier to remember. How about God is the God who chooses and blesses? Chooses, sends, and blesses. How about that? God is constantly choosing people, moving them around, blessing them, and blessing through them. So how about that? God is the God who chooses, sends, and blesses. Okay. That's important to know. Genesis 15, 7 to 20. This is one of the most beautiful passages in the Old Testament. We're looking at a bunch of good ones today. So if you've got a highlighter, put it to work. Okay, so I'll pause and set the scene for you. So uh, back in, in not just the Old Testament, back in the ancient Near East, uh, there was a, a process for cutting a covenant. Um, and uh, you could, this is illustrated in Jeremiah, but uh, where basically what you had to do, a covenant was usually made between a king and a, and a lesser lord. So let's say the, the king of Egypt might make a... a um, a, a covenant with, say, the, the king of Moab or the governor of Thebes. And, and it, it would, basically what you'd do is you'd take a bunch of sacrificial animals and you'd cut them right down the middle and you'd pull them apart and you'd create a pathway of blood, it was called. And then the lesser party had to walk through the pieces. And while he walked through the pieces, he proclaimed what was called a self-maledictory curse. He'd walk, so imagine seven cut animals split, and as he walked through, he would say, so let it be done to me if I am not faithful 
to the terms of this covenant, right? So that, that, that's what had to happen. And so in the story, if you know, God tells Abraham to get these ceremonial animals, split them, pull them apart, and make a pathway of blood. And I don't know if you remember, but then Abraham was like batting away the birds because the birds would try to come. And, and, but God said, keep the birds away until nighttime. Okay, and then you, you just said, then Abraham sees this, these, these things, a smoking pot. Read it to us again. No, no, I gave you the background. So now you got it. Now you just read it. Give us the smoking pot. So you've started at Genesis 15, verse 7? Oh, yeah, no, it says Genesis 15, 7 to, 7 to 20. So, yeah, start up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, and we'll just say et cetera there from all the ites. Okay, so the picture is God makes a covenant, pulls all the animals apart, and Abraham expects to walk through the pieces because he's the lesser party. But what happens? What happens? Yeah, God puts Abraham to sleep, and, and under the figure of a flaming furnace and a, and a, or a smoking furnace and a fire, flaming torch, which is basically the same symbols that will lead the people out of Exodus, right? The pillar of cloud and the fire thing, right? Symbols for God. The s- God, under the power of these symbols, goes through the pieces, which is incredible. What God is actually saying is, I'm going to fulfill both sides of the covenant, right? Uh, I'm going to do what you need to do to receive these blessings, and I'm going to do what only I can do to give these blessings. That's an incredible God. So God is the God who fulfills our side of the covenant. God is the God who fulfills our side of the covenant. That's the gospel. See, the gospel doesn't change, Old Testament and New. God never lowers the bar. He just gives extraordinary help. God is the God who fulfills our side of the covenant. Yeah. Or another way you could say it is who does for us what we could never do for ourselves. Right? That's the gospel. All right, next one. Genesis 22.1. Oh, I like this one. Whoa. All right. Now, we could have read the whole thing, but we just for sake of time, just that one verse. You know the story, right? That's the story of Abraham taking Isaac. It's with the story the Jews call the binding of Isaac, right? Everybody knows that story? Shake your head if you know that story. Good. All right. But what's the point? God is the God who what? Now read, read the verse again. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so how about this? God is the God who tests our faith. 
Another way you could put it is God is the God who doesn't take us at our word. Because we, we could all say, oh, I believe, right? Like, uh, okay, well, let's see. Right? But we'll just leave it as God is the God who tests our faith. Okay. All right. Exodus 21 to 6. Let's have that one now. All right, so what you have there is the preamble to the Ten Commandments and the first two commandments, right? We could have had you read all ten, but again, just for the sake of time, we just had to do two. What's the point? Mm -hmm, yep. Yep, say again. Yep. But what's the preamble? So you got the point of the commandments. They, everything you guys just said is true. They are a warning. They, the commandments are like bumper rails. They tell you... If you go any further than this, you're in the ditch. So that's true. There, it's a moral code. Absolutely. This is the way you walk. That's absolutely true. But what about the preamble? I am the God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. What's the connection? He is? Yeah. God is the God who saves and commands. If you don't get that order, you miss the gospel. What if it were, what if God had said to the people in Egypt, if you keep these Ten Commandments, I will redeem you from the house of slavery. What does that turn religion in, What does that turn the religion into? That would be the worst religion ever. The best religion ever is God says, I'll save you first. You won't do anything. But then once you're mine, I'll show you how to live. That's the best thing ever. So God is the God who saves. Oh, don't write it this way. Anathema. Yeah, cross that out and write it the other way. God is the God who saves okay, so and commands. Commanding. Oh, that would be the worst. I'd quit. There we go. Woo! That was close. Yeah. Woo! Okay. All right. Hosea 3, verse 1. Yeah, cakes of raisins, right? God is a God who hates cakes of raisins. That's not the point. No, no I'm just... <laughs> don't write that down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no. So in Hosea 3.1, it's a fascinating story. Um, so in, in the book of Hosea, God tells a young prophet. He calls a young man who's 19 years old. By the way, just most of you in this room are, are moms. I, imagine God called your son to... to to do this. God calls a 19-year-old boy named Hosea, tells him to go marry a woman of whoredom, a wife of whoredom. Now, we assume that that mean, doesn't mean that she was already a prostitute. We assume it means a, a woman that God knew would become a whore. She basically, there was something wrong with her. She, she was not capable of fidelity. And, and, and we know that because they had three kids. The first child appears to have been theirs, meaning uh, Hosea and his wife together, Gomer, the second two appear to have been women or children that she actually conceived through prostitution. So God tells this 19-year-old boy to go and marry a woman of whoredom, a woman who's a whore at heart is literally what it means. Um, and he does. And then God says, basically, this is me and Israel. So God says, that's, that's, that's what happened to me. I'm, I married a woman, as it were, who had a twisted heart. But I married her knowing what she was going to do. It's a story of, of tremendous grace. It's firm, hard grace. So the story is, Hosea marries this young gal. She, they have a child together. At some point, I guess she becomes dissatisfied with the marriage, whatever. She wanders away, becomes a prostitute, has two more children. 
Hosea goes and buys her out of prostitution. It actually gives the amount he paid, which was the amount you'd pay for a slave. Um, And so she had become literally a sex slave. And Hosea went and bought her and originally gave the children names that made it clear that they were not his. It was very unfortunate, right? He gives the ch- one child the name No Mercy and the next child the name Not Mine, uh, which is unfortunate, right? When you go to the baseball game and that's sewn under the back of your uniform. Um, but then, you know, the story becomes a story of grace because he puts his wife under house arrest. He's told basically to lock her in the house. And he's to cut her off from all these influences that had corrupted her soul. But he's not just putting her on house arrest. He's basically putting her on, like, date night arrest because his job is to woo her so that at the end of her detox, she will call him my husband and not my master. So at the beginning, the detox, the house arrest, feels abusive. But at the end, she has come to, she's fallen in love with her husband. And God says, that's my relationship with Israel. Um, and, and the house arrest, the detox, is the exile that's coming. He basically says, I'm sending you into exile, not to kill you, but actually to wean you off of everything you've loved instead of me, and then eventually to win you back to myself, and, and to claim to greatly expand the family. So he says, these children that were called no mercy and not my people will be called mercy and my people. And those verses are picked up in the New Testament by both Paul and Peter, interpreted as the ingathering of the Gentiles. So God says back in Hosea, this is not to kill you. This is actually to purify you and then greatly expand you. And that great expansion is the gathering into the Gentiles, right? So the church is much bigger than it was when that prophecy was spoken, but only after a very long and hard house arrest. So what's the point? Why do do we just tell that terrible story? God is the God who what? How about loves people who don't deserve it? And then you might even put in brackets, but makes them fit objects of his love. So let's do that. God is the God who loves people who don't deserve it. And then put in brackets and makes them fit objects. I'll tell you in just a minute. Fit objects of his love. Not as in he makes them physically fit. Fit means appropriate of his love. So, Martin, yeah, and you can close that bracket. So, Martin Luther says this he says, one of the things you have to understand is that God does not find that which he loves. God makes that which he loves. That's the the whole point of the story of Hosea. She was a whore. Hosea should not have loved her. He was told who she was. But he was told to marry her and love her anyway. But then he was told to do the really hard work to make her a woman he would want to love and that she would love him. So that's who God is. God loves people and chooses people who don't deserve it. But then, by grace, he makes them fit objects of his love. But, and by the way, this is, this is the rhythm of the gospel in the New Testament. In, in the New Testament, we're told salvation is all of grace, right? I mean, think of the book of Ephesians. We know that pretty well, and it's small. In the first couple of chapters of Ephesians, we're constantly told that God loved us and we didn't deserve it. Salvation was all of grace. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, right? It, not, we're saved by faith, by grace. Not, or we're saved by faith, not by works, lest any man should boast, right? So you didn't deserve it. But then somebody read for me Ephesians 4.1. Second half, after he said, like, you didn't deserve it. You were a loser. God loved you anyway. You were predestined. In love, he predestined. Okay. Then the next three chapters are all about what? Starting at Ephesians 4, verse 1. Read that. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling. Walk worthy. So Paul says, now we're going to talk about becoming, right, by the grace of God, becoming fit objects of his love. We're going to become who by grace we have been made. Right? The whole the gospel is basically the story. And by the way, this, this story is told in a bunch of different ways. In Ezekiel, the story is about how God found this baby who was aborted. 
Do you remember that? It's a gross story. He finds this baby who's aborted, like nobody cut the cords, covered in her own blood. And, but God took pity, raised her up. She became a beautiful woman, became his bride, right? So this, the story of the gospel is about how God chooses people who, that don't deserve his love, that are utterly unlovely, but then he makes them fit objects of his love. So it's, it, it's the same with adoption, right? Like the Bible's constantly switching between metaphors because no one metaphor fully captures the gospel. So God is like a husband who, who, who marries a woman who doesn't deserve it. Or he's like a father who adopts children out of the gutter, but then teaches them how to be royal sons and daughters. All of Christian ethics is about becoming who you have been made by grace. So we don't learn to use the right fork and all the right, so that we will be chosen by God. That would be works-based salvation. He chose us when we were in the gutter. But then he says, now I'm going to help you act like who you are. You are a child of the king. You, you are my beloved son, my beloved daughter. Now I'm going to help you dress and look the part. Exactly. It's, it's 2 Corinthians 3.18. We all with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord as though in a mirror, are being transformed by one degree of glory to the next into the same image for this comes from the Lord who is the spirit so what does the spirit do once the seed of Jesus which is the spirit is in us according to first John 3 9 what does he do changes us into who we are by grace that's the gospel the gospel so that's why we have to be careful with saying things like well God accepts us just as we are kind of true uh, actually God accept, it's better to say this God accepts us knowing exactly who we are but then he makes us into who we were always meant to be. So it's different. It's not exactly true, that saying. Okay, next one. Hosea 5.12. By the way, read that again. It's my favorite. So, and read it really loud and love it. It's not the best thing in the Bible. So... God says, he says, here, I'm going to help you understand who I am. I am like a moth uh, or like dry rot. What he's basically saying, he's talking, remember, uh, so that Israel is like a woman who has straight gone away and become a prostitute. And God says to Israel, I am going to slowly eat away at everything you love instead of me. What, what is it that you're leaning on instead of me? I'm going to ruin it. I'm going to destroy it. And he actually says, basically, he, basically God says, this, here's a, a way to visualize it. Israel is like, is like a woman who's run away from God. And God says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to poison all the wells out there in the desert. And then I'm going to sing you a love song from the window. I'm going to ruin everything you think that is going to help you run away from me. And then I'm going to call you back to myself. That's who God is, right? He destroys everything everything his people trust in instead of him, which is why it's very dangerous to have idols because God will eat them. He'll eat them. So be very careful about making your marriage your idol. To, uh, to this room, I'll say, be very careful about making your kids your idol. God will eat whatever you lean on or love as if it were him. So, he is the God who destroys everything, or how about erodes? Destroys slash erodes everything we love and lean on instead of him. Destroys, erodes everything we love and lean on instead of him. All right, let's give it up for our scribe. Well done. Excellent. Shyness is a sin. If you're going to learn anything today, it's going to be that. <laughs> what did you learn at Bible study tonight? Shyness is a sin. Okay, yeah, we're at, uh, well, I don't know. What, uh, what was it? Okay, here we go. Hosea 5, 14 to 15. Who's got it? Okay. 
Okay, so that's the scary one. So there, the greater context is, he says that, you know, Israel is like this stupid, silly dove who is like fluttering up and, up and down, trying to make alliances. So what Israel was doing at the time was trying to play Egypt uh, against Assyria. So they're playing a very dangerous game. They were trying to use one superpower against another and, and trying to create this, this peace between the two. And God says, you keep, because Israel was in, the, in between these two powers. Egypt is down here. Israel is, Israel is a land bridge between Africa and Asia. I assume you know that, which is why there are so many wars there. Um, and, and so they were constantly going, they'd go down to Egypt and make a deal. And then they'd go up to Assyria and make a deal. And they thought that by this going up and down the road to Egypt and Assyria, they could make themselves safe. And God says, you're fools. He says, I am the lion on the side of the road. And the next time you pass down this way, I'm going to grab you and maul you and lead you bleeding in the ditch. Why? Because you went down and you went up and you never came to me. Right? God says all the time, I don't want you trusting in physical supports. I don't want you trusting. Some trust in chariots, but we will trust in the Lord our God. Remember that? Right? And, and so here's, here's what we've learned. God is like a lion. So what are we going to put here? God, here's what we're, I'll, gi- I'll give you what the text says and you decide how you want to say it. God is like a lion who punishes us in our foolish pursuits. How do you want to write that? Uh, God is like a lion who punishes us fiercely. How do you want to say it? Who can be fierce? God can be ferocious in punishment. That's fair. God is the God who is ferocious in punishment. But I'd put it in, in brackets. For our good. Ferocious in punishment. Actually, he also, in this same book of Hosea, describes himself as a bear and a leopard, making the same point. Ferocious in punishment. Then put in brackets... Yeah, that's good. We don't, we're not going to care about spying. For our good. Not to kill us, but to save us. Meaning, let's put it this way. If we're going to put it in very human terms, God gives a good bare bum spank. Yeah. Okay, next one. Hosea 11.1. That's a really beautiful text. And if we had more time, we'd read all the way down to verse 5. But um, basically, in this little passage, God compares himself to a father and, at at one point, as a mother. So he says, I'm like a father who carries his son, right? Like something scares the the little boy, and the dad picks him up and carries him. But then at another point in the story, he says, I'm like a mother who who holds the little baby's hands while while he takes his first stumbling steps. So uh, let's say God is like a parent who is, a, who is tender and teaches. How about that? So God is like a parent who is tender and who teaches. Yeah, that's, Hosea 11 is beautiful. All right, how about Hosea 13, 4 to 8? And you say, why are there so many from Hosea? Uh, actually, Hosea is a neat book. Because it's filled with, with pictures. Um, God is always like something. He's like a moth or a lion or a leopard or a mom or a husband. It, it's, it's just, it's the, it's, if you want one book of the Bible where you're going to figure out who God is towards us for our salvation, Hosea is your go-to. It's just a beautiful book. All right, so let's have someone read that. 13... So how about this? God is the God who knows us and pursues us. Okay. How about Hosea 14, 4 to 9?
Yeah, it's, it's, those are overlapping images. You could choose any of them. So first of all, he says, God is like the dew who brings refreshment to a barren land. Uh, then he also says he's like a, or sorry, first he says he's like a physician who heals. I've healed you. But then he also says uh, he's like a, an evergreen cypress who, who gives sap so that you can produce fruit. So he's, this, he, he's the one who makes us flourish. He's the one who restores us. He's the one who gives us life. So how do you want to how do you want to put that? God is the God who what? Yeah, how about restores us and brings us back to life? Good. All right, now we're into the New Testament. And just to keep it simple, I've, as you can see, I did a bunch from Hosea, I did a bunch from Matthew, just so you're not flipping all over the place. You can get this stuff from a bunch of places because. God doesn't change from one book of the Bible to the next. All right, let's go. These, these ones will be quick because we know these better. Matthew 5, 1 to 2. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped a line there, didn't I? Matthew 3, 13 to 17. Go. Yeah, so that's a very interesting, interesting passage. I started with the, the line about Jesus going to John the Baptist, and John's like, I should not be baptizing you. But Jesus said, no, it's necessary to fulfill all righteousness. So, Jesus, so God is the God who, do, who lives the life we never could. So that's Jesus stepping into the human story at that point, saying, I've come to fulfill all righteousness. I've come to live a perfect human life. You could also say, you could put whatever you like here, but that's what stands out to me. You could also put uh, that God is the God who enters the human story. That, that's the most fascinating thing about Christianity. There's nothing like that in any other religion. Like Muhammad, Muhammad is, is not Allah in the flesh. Muhammad is a prophet who had a dream in a cave. Um, right? There's... This is unique. What is unique about Jesus is, is that he is God of the flesh. Like when you read that encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus in John 3, Jesus says basically the reason you should listen to me is because I'm the only one who's been up in heaven and come down. Nobody else has. Um, why would you get your information from any other person or prophet? Muhammad's never been to heaven. He had a dream in a cave, right? Jesus was in heaven. As God. He's God in the flesh. He knows everything there is to know. He's come down. He's got, he's got unique insights. He's, he's man. He's God. It's amazing. All right, next one. Matthew 4, 1 to 4. So uh, that's a very interesting story. You'll notice uh, that, that uh, Jesus basically recapitulates the history of Israel, um, right? So Israel was in the desert for how long? 40 years. So Jesus was in the desert for? 40 days. Israel was tempted in the, in the desert, and did they succeed or fail? Right. So Jesus was in the desert, and he was tempted. Did he succeed or fail? Right. So God is the God who corrects our mistakes. So to, to give you a big picture, most theologians believe that Adam and Eve were not, like were in the garden, uh, basically on probation. Uh, it was like probation for a job. You know, you get your job at Tim Hortons and there's three weeks where they can fire you without cause. Uh, they're, they're basically just watching you, right? And, and uh, that's what Adam and Eve in the garden was. The deal was God wanted vice regents, people who were going to be under him and over all creation. But the deal was 
they had to be willing to work under God. So they had to rule with reference to the Word of God. They had to believe that uh, God's Word was sovereign. So basically, it was just a, a simple test, right? There's one tree in the garden. I'll put a little fence around it. If you can go, like whatever it was, three weeks without touching this tree, then basically the test is over and game on. Uh, but they failed the test, right? They, what they proved is that they wanted to be over everything without reference to the Word of God. Okay. But the plan doesn't change. God's plan is to rule the cosmos through the vice regency of men and women. But we're no longer capable of passing the probation. So Jesus came basically three years, right? His ministry was three years. I mean, his life was 30, 30 years. But basically to, to pass probation as a human being. One human being needed to pass the test in order for the plan to be enacted. God's plan is to rule the world and bless the universe through a perfectly obedient human being. That's what Jesus is, right? So, All right, next one. Matthew 4, 12 to 17. We'll have to move faster here so that we can, we can get through all this in the time that we have. But how, so, I'll, how about this? God is the God who brings light into the dark. All right, Matthew 5, 1 to 2. And let's have a bunch of people looking up the next one and the next one and the next one so we can do this rapid fire. Matthew 5, 1 to 2. That's okay. Yep, good. So God is the God who teaches us how to live in the kingdom. All right, next one, Matthew 9, 6. So God is the God who forgives sins. Okay, next one. Matthew. Yep. If you got it, go. Rachel has it. I can tell by looking at her. Go. How about this? God is the God who gives the kingdom to whomever he will. We don't build the kingdom, we receive the kingdom. God is the God who gives the kingdom to whomever he will. All right, next, Matthew 26, 27, 28. God is the God who purchases our redemption. All right, next. You go, keep going, you're good. Um, 
Okay, how about this? God is the one who satisfies his own wrath. Okay, next. God is the one who has authority over death. Or which one do we skip? We may have put two together, but I think we're I think we're okay. What was it that we missed? Matthew four nineteen. Well, so someone read that one. We'll just put this one in brackets. Matthew four nineteen. Right. So God is the one who gathers in His people. Fishers of men is a phrase from Jeremiah seventeen seventeen. What's that? That was Matthew 4.19. We skipped it by accident. Yeah, so the numbers are going to be off. Just, just use a line and, and go to it or put in brackets Matthew 4.19. Okay, so now what are we at? Colossians 2.13. And would you be willing to finish the game out as our scribe? Yeah, just flip the picture or the page. Whoop. All right. We'll come back to it. These will be here. You can come back to them afterwards, but I do want to get through it. All right, you got it. Flip it. All right. Colossians. Who's got that one? That is the answer to Genesis 3.15. God is the one who defeats defeats our enemy. Okay, and then the last one, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. God is the one who brings us home. All right. On the count of three, everyone say, whoo! One, two, three. Very good. That's a lot. You just did a course on the doctrine of God. How do you feel? Yay. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to gather. We're going to take five minutes, and then we're going to close in prayer. But I want you to gather in groups of three or four. And I just want you to answer, each person in the group can answer one of these three questions. Question number one, which of those surprised you most, one you haven't seen before? Number two, which of those challenges you the most? Meaning, actually, your present doctrine of God needs to change in light of what you just read. What surprises you the most? What challenges you the most? And then number three, what thrills you the most? Which one of those are you going to go home singing in your heart? Okay, get together in groups of three or four. I'm going to give you five minutes, and then we're going to close it.